fairy book land of mists and veils, guarded by imposing castles, embodied by the crown. This tiny island that once ruled the world has had a complex relationship with India. The Indian diaspora that makes an enormous contribution to Britain. Indians are extremely good business people. Indians has developed got a reputation in the UK for being successful, for studying, uh, for being law-abiding. We all came as a shopkeeper, and today we are hoteliers, manufacturers, in pharmacies, food. Indian diaspora has done very well. There's 10,000 businesses here in London run by people from within the Indian community, and many of those businesses are very large businesses. The diaspora that have come from India into the United Kingdom have made a huge difference to this country. Quite literally, they've built cities uh, with their hands, with their money, with their resources, with their talents and with their skills. In sports, in business, in art, you name it, Indians are reaching the very top. And that glass ceiling has been absolutely shattered. It's not a strange thing to see an Indian person interviewing a huge A-list star or even being the huge A-list star. And we've made our mark and we are continuing to move forward. Food, fashion, sport, culture, and even language have only blossomed from the ebb and flow. The give and take that has marked this very special bond between India and the United Kingdom. I think the relationship goes back historically clearly to the days of uh, empire, uh, some of which was good and some of which was, of course, less good. So I think the links between India and the UK go back many, many centuries. I think that's why so many people in, uh, in India speak English, and that's why we have a natural empathy with one another. Keeping these historic relations going are Britain's Indians. The tiny Indian diaspora in UK, just 3% of the population, have long punched much above their weight. Their colors shimmer through the land. Their flavors spice every aspect of life in this country that's become home. These people that have become family. As London sheds slumberous sleep and raises its face to an eastern dawn, Billingsgate Market repeats centuries-old rhythms as it bustles to feed the city. They're very much an integral part of the city, and of course, um, they also provide Londoners with their, their favourite source of food, which of course is the Indian restaurants, and, um, and there's a lot of those in London. And playing his part in what was once the largest fish market in the world is Atul Kocha, the first Indian chef to receive the coveted Michelin star. Morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good to see you. We've been working together a few years now. Come down to market, tell me what you like, and I'll tell him if we've got it, if it's fresh enough, if it's not good enough, I won't sell it to him. First few years, I spent learning what British life means, what British agriculture means, what British fishery means. And slowly but surely, I've embraced all that into my food. After picking his ingredients, he heads towards his restaurant, Benares, to prepare a lip-smacking meal. His restaurant functions like a slick machine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we have beautiful John Dory, which we'll be prepare, prepping today. So I want you guys to just help me through the process. Let's kick it. Michelin stars or recognition by uh, different guides was not even thought of, really speaking. And I set out from that day that I'm going to change the perception. Looking back, after a good 20 years or so, we are six of us who hold Michelin stars. In my restaurant, you have to book in three weeks in advance, otherwise forget it, you can't get in. Today, he's cooking his version of a legendary British dish, fish and mushy peas. I love mushy peas. I love British mushy peas and I love mushy peas from India, which is from Banaras actually. They call it Nimona. I have done the same flavor. And the Britishness comes from by adding a little bit of cream while um, crushing it so that it just gives a nice smooth blend. And it goes well with my fish. The tomato looks amazing. It's a very British plate with Indian flavor. As I lived in the United Kingdom and practiced what I loved, uh, I saw it as a very fair country. 
and I felt very much home here. One of the biggest aspects of India that is a daily part of British life is Indian food. Uh, Britain is a nation of curryholics. Home of the chicken tikka masala, Britain's love for Indian food speaks for how wholeheartedly it's accepted the diaspora and proved the gateway to wealth for many Indians. Doing more to encourage this craze for Indian curry is noted chef and author Monisha Bhardwaj. I started my own cooking school about eight years ago. It's called Cooking with Monisha. And this was in response to the fact that more and more people are now wanting to cook Indian food at home. My school specializes in home-style, healthy, delicious, easy cooking, which I think everyone wants now. Taking a much more personal approach, Monisha invites students into a home that's also the venue for her class, Cooking with Monisha. The people who come to my school are mainly uh, non-Indians but they come from all over the world. So I've had people come from America, from Canada, from all over Europe, from as far as Japan. The camaraderie of home cooking builds bonds and encourages students from every background to come and savor spices they've never seen, flavors they've only dreamed. I think everyone can cook if they have a passion for it. Do you want a curry that is very spicy or very medium? Very spicy. Well, no, we will we'll have to take average for me. What yeah. would you like? Me spicy. Very? I love, yeah. On a scale of 1 to 10? 10. Yeah. No, maybe not. <laughs> Simple home cooking is Monisha's mantra. Once the right instructions are given, it's time for her students to take center stage. The table is laid and the ladies relish their result. But when cooking a meal from scratch isn't the answer, another enterprising Indian, Lord Noon, has stepped in with a solution. One of the pioneers in bringing authentic Indian food to the British table is Noon Products, a single largest producer of frozen Indian food. They are not content to rest on their laurels, mining regional cuisines in India and Asia. We work on all different types of recipes from cuisines all over the world. Obviously, we focus more on Indian and Oriental, but we also have expertise in other areas. The reason for their success lies in fierce quality checks that ensure their customers are never left with a bad taste. Well, I think clearly the UK is a very diverse culture now. Um, the UK population travel a lot, so they um, are finding new recipes and new dishes that they want to try. Um, I guess they perhaps don't know how to cook it themselves, so they're looking for companies such as ourselves to be able to make it for them. And the mastermind behind this mecca of taste is Lord Noon. We are the major players in, in particularly in the United Kingdom for supplying chilled Indian or any Chinese, Thai, continental, all sorts of food. And we manufacture approximately half a million meals per day. Lord Noon, I think, is a very good example with, with, with uh, his food production, which started very small and has become huge. That sort of example is, is the changing nature of, of Indian businesses and the growing nature and the growing importance of Indian businesses in, in London. When I started this company, I got my MBE from the Queen. Therefore, it's important to remember that if you work hard in this country, you are recognized. Another man who has been recognized for his hard work and commitment over the last 50 years is Vitabiotics, Dr. Karthar Singh Lalwani. I went straight into manufacturing my research product, patented product, for manufactured and sell them here and export them. In the early 70s, Karthar Lalwani started his pharmacy company at a time when Indians were considered good traders but not researchers. Never one to let uneven odds stop him, Kartar Lalwani grew Vitabiotics into Britain's largest nutritional health supplement company. Beyond building empires, the diaspora has developed a talent for giving back. Perhaps the best known and most widely appreciated of all British Indian philanthropy efforts is Lord Swaraj Paul's contribution to saving London's iconic zoo. This magnificent gesture 
is a gift from a loving father to the city and zoo that gave him so much precious time with his beloved daughter. We're very fortunate that Lord Paul has, has um, been a supporter of ours for a very long time. Um, it was a good 20 years or so that he made a very large donation for our children's zoo and he asked for it to be in memory of his, his daughter Ambika and it became the Ambika Paul Children's Zoo and that was a great start for that whole area for us. It was an important time because the zoo was having a tough time financially and Lord Paul's very generous support at that time really helped a large part of the zoo move forward, develop and become a wonderful feature uh, for London Zoo, for families ever since then. A place where Lord Paul sees the same joy and laughter that he once saw in Ambika, who loved to come here as a respite between grueling bouts of cancer. 1966, my daughter fell ill and uh, the, we brought her for treatment. We were here for 22 months looking after her. And then, unfortunately, we lost her. Zoo has become a very sentimental place from my point of view. Because I do this thing. I have dedicated my business to Ambika. I mean, I think she's just a guide, guiding hand. The Ambika Paul Children's Zoo has flourished, bringing joy to many families and peace to its benefactors. There is no other entertainment in the world where I have seen, and I have seen lots of parts of the world, where children and parents can interact with each other in that manner. Like Lord Swaraj Paul, Lord Meghnath Desai has contributed hugely, first to intellectual life and then public service in the United Kingdom. Yet this barren, fetid at home and abroad chooses to balance his outsized contribution with a low-key lifestyle. I have multiple identities. I have an Indian identity, but most of the time I have a British identity. Uh, I don't lose my Indian identity, but I don't need to display it when I'm dealing in most of the time in, in British culture. And that has been a great advantage. At home, away from worldly debates, Lord Desai spends time with his life's passion, books and writing, which eventually led him to his other great love, his wife. We brought together because I had written this book on the lip Kumar. And Sushma was, uh, was the managing editor of the manuscript. That's how we met. So we met through book writing. Love finds various paths, even if it means migrating. Whether for love, opportunity, education, or leisure. I started living here only after meeting my husband, Meghnath Desai. He decided that we were going to get married uh, sometime soon. It was a very pleasant decision that he took and it ended up with me relocating uh, to the UK. A popular landing place in England is Leicester, a city that boasts the UK's highest ethnic diversity and representing this multicultural, multiracial Multi-ethnic New Britannia is Keith Vaz. This is the centre of the Asian community in Britain. People arrived here 30 years ago and transformed what was a rundown area into one of the most impressive shopping areas in the world. Hello, ladies. Are you lost? No. Where are you from? Nottingham. Nottingham. You see, there are people from all over the country. They've even come from Nottingham to Leicester. I'm Keith Vaz. Hello. I'm the MP for Leicester. Hi. The country's longest serving Asian MP, Keith, is frequently named among Britain's most influential Asian. Like the rest of England, in Leicester too, the diaspora have contributed hugely to the city's growth without losing touch with their roots. I think the Indian community has achieved so much in a very short space of time because one, this is a culture that is strong and productive. Secondly, because they've been dedicated, hardworking, they've not relied on benefits. And since we recently discovered that Prince William may well have Indian blood in him through a previous uh, ancestor, I think that's going to help enormously. I always thought he was a cousin of mine, and now I know he is. Cousins or not, the Brotherhood goes back to the World Wars 
where Indians and Britons fought shoulder to shoulder. So you, you find some, some very, very interesting photographs showing Indian soldiers and British soldiers fighting next to each other side by side. A memorial to those brave soldiers was constructed in London, close to Buckingham Palace. A memorial which wouldn't have happened without Baroness Flather. Our men did a very good job. They weren't just cannon fodder. Uh, in the Second World War, as I said, they were crucial. So I think London is the place where they should be remembered. The size particularly of the contingents from countries like India, which exceeded a million, are, are just breathtaking, really. On top of that, there was the huge support that India as a country gave to the British and other nations who were serving in that part of the world. So it wasn't just the Indian military, it was the Indian civilians who contributed hugely. We did come and stand by them when they most needed our help. And why do you think people have come here? Why do you think the immigration started? It started because of the war. With an economy devastated by war, suffering the loss of a significant proportion of its population, Britain appealed to men and women from across the empire to come rebuild factories, restart industry, and reignite the economy. Britain actively encouraged migration to Britain to help rebuild the country after the end of the Second World War. Um, also to recruit um, doctors and nurses for the newly founded NHS, which happened in 1948. Their toil reshaped Britain and their success helped build the path to migration for the next wave of Indian immigrants who came here via Africa. The real change took place when the East African Indians came. Uh, they went into small businesses uh, and then the children went into professions. Thrown out of one country, determined to prove their worth in a new one, East African Indians worked long and hard, revolutionizing retail and offering much greater convenience to British consumers. What is ignored is the many mom and pop entrepreneurial stories which are hidden below the carpet. And these are the boys and girls and the men and women who have really reshaped um, the enterprise mindset of a new country. By going there, many came from Africa, many came from India. The sorts of businesses that Indian businesses have been have been, you know, in many cases, traditional businesses, uh, import, export, and, and, and shops. Uh, and I think that has grown into, into something bigger. Economic success helped pave the path to social acceptance, changing the way Indians were viewed by the British. But equally important to the diaspora's integration was becoming part of the mosaic of cultures that is modern Britain. And celebrating this incredible diversity is the South Bank Centre. This is the most extraordinary place. First of all, the size of it. It's 21 acres, which is enormous. It's probably one of the largest art centres in the world. And after the Second World War, when people really were thinking, how can you keep peace? And what should peace look like? It was decided that on the south side of the river, you would create this amazing festival of Britain which was about not just Britain, actually, but about the whole idea of the creativity of the world. The Festival of Alchemy was started to encourage dialogue between Britain, its Indian origin citizens, and India itself. And helping in this mission from the Indian perspective is renowned Kathak dancer, Gauri Sharma Tripathi. I spend a lot of time in India and a lot of time in UK as well. So I'm managing my time between two very interesting spaces, as I say, my Jan Bhumi and my Kan Bhumi. My first dialogue with Jude started. She said, Gauri, if you were to run South Bank Centre, what would you do? And that's the seed of Alchemy, which is a festival which is looking at with India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Bhutan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, and seeing how do we connect with the diaspora. If alchemy celebrates the public impact of the dialogue between cultures, 
making it personal are two liver pavilions, a Singh twins. From the city of the Beatles, artists Amrit and Rabindra's determination to showcase their city has created a unique new art form that celebrates Britain using distinctly Indian vocabulary. What inspires us to combine the two cultures is the experience we had as young art students, whereby the fact that we were inspired by the Indian miniature painting as a personal form of expression was not really accepted because it wasn't seen as something that was valid within Western contemporary art. Um, you know, our art tutors really told us that the Indian miniature was backward and outdated and had no place in modern art, and I think that really fired us up to prove them otherwise. And our life's mission, if you like, as artists, has been to uh, prove the point that Indian miniature painting, as with all traditional art forms, has a real place uh, and a value within contemporary art and contemporary um, societies. On their journey to success, the Singh twins found resistance from every quarter. But they kept at their dream, eventually carving a niche for themselves in the world of British art. And today, their vision of Liverpool, a British city depicted through Eastern eyes, is what holds sway. In one of our paintings that we were commissioned to do for the city called Arts Matters, there's a, a detail of three dancing girls. Actually, the poses of the three women are taken from um, the very famous painting by Raphael called The Three Graces. And in our painting, the three graces don't represent commerce and shipping as these buildings do. They have come to represent um, the city of Liverpool as it is today, which is this great centre of arts and entertainment and culture. There is a lot of cultural identity that has been cross-referenced, whether it be through language or fashion or whatever. We've got, you know, kind of Bollywood really making an impact on British life and culture and Indian food making such an impact. Mm -hmm. So I think the Western audience actually can relate to the fact that our work is bringing together this multicultural eclecticism. Similar conversations between East and West take place in London in the East End studio of Pure Jewels. With a history of travel from India to Africa, and then Britain, this jewellery house uses British designers to celebrate their stories in symphonies of diamonds and gold. The one real resource that they had to hand, which was extremely valuable, was the machinery and the tools to make jewellery, you know, that they, they brought along with them, that, that was shipped across. There was a real opportunity that, okay, with relatively little, they could produce products, they could produce something that was needed at the time, and they could produce a loyal uh, customer base and following that really appreciated the workmanship and appreciated the, uh, the quality and the integrity of the company. While the designs might be Laura's, the stories remain Jai's, as does the vision behind all Pure Jewels collections that celebrate the struggles of Jai's father and grandfather. Hi, Laura. You know that traditional earring that you'd uh, asked for, for the reference for uh, the ear chain? I've created this story about uh, a Maharani who lives in a grand palace. It's always a nice starting point when you've got um, some sort of uh, story and, and combining different references from the traditional to, to the contemporary. Within the language of jewellery design, we want to contribute as a company to a unique language which is, which is British but has Asian roots. I think it all started in the 1980s where I saw it unfold in front of my eyes where when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister uh, she created an atmosphere of aspiration, she championed entrepreneurship, uh, she opened up the City of London for example uh, and I believe Britain became much more meritocratic. Driving in this new meritocratic Britain came easily to Lord Billy Moria, whose successful beer brand Cobra was designed around the popularity of Indian food. Meant to be an accompaniment to spicy curries, Cobra was eagerly adopted by Britain's curry mat public. I always see, even with my brand Cobra beer, I always feel very happy when the Indian community in Britain consume Cobra beer because I see them as ambassadors uh, for the product. And of course, a lot of Indians will consume Cobra beer with pride as a brand from India that is now a household name in the UK and one of the fastest growing beer brands in Britain.
Like beer, another British pursuit that's become an Indian passion is cricket. There are huge hotbeds of, of um, Indian support for, for cricket and it's good to see them coming through and playing in the county game. Indian origin players are a vital part of British cricket with the Chennai-born Nasir Hussain even captaining the national team. The Indians, we howl and shout and we enjoy the cricket, but what have we done for the British cricket? Lord Noon, a cricket enthusiast, convinced a host of his fellow businessmen to rally around the creation of an India room at London's famous Surrey Cricket Ground. We've got to put some mark there. We've got to put some footprint there. And I think it was a very nice uh, for the Oval Committee in those days to agree to give us a place for India. We photographs of all our contemporary cricketers, not to forget Dravid and Tendulkar, and uh, I think it has become very popular. Yeah, the India Room was part of the development when we built the OCS stand back in 2005. Um, we were very lucky to have a group of Indian businessmen based in London who helped part fund the, the OCS stand, and as such we have an India Room, which is very important to us. The, the, it's one of our prime hospitality areas, so, so for a test match or uh, one-day internationals, it, it's always one of the, the, the best places to be in the ground. Even as Lord Noon enjoys his afternoon of cricket, his vision goes much beyond the ground as he dares to dream of a Britain where everyone has the same opportunities to succeed that he did, avoids the mistakes he made, and so he's endowed the Noon Educational Centre at the University of East London. When you earn in a country like this, give it back. I'm not a multi-millionaire, but whatever I could, I have done it, and I'm very happy about it. Our student population is made up of students from all over the world. So what we wanted to do with the Noon Center and, and the contribution that Lord Noon has really made to our uh, business school is by really celebrating diversity in terms of working with employers to help them realize that actually it's great business, not just good business, to have a diverse uh, workforce. In the land of Oxford and Cambridge, education has always been a favored preoccupation, shaping the ideas and ideals of Indians from the leaders of the freedom struggle onwards. It's little wonder that many of the diaspora's philanthropic efforts revolve around increasing access to Britain's world-class universities. And ensuring that more Indians get a chance to study here in the United Kingdom is Azad Shivdasani, who reminisces about student days at Oxford's Trinity College. Trinity undergrads got into Balliol and they went to the top to the, the toilets and they removed the, the ball clock. It prevents the water from overflowing, so all the, the Balliol uh, staff and graduates and undergraduates waking up at um, seven o'clock in the morning and what they were confronted with was a college quite happily being flooded with water pouring down all the staircases. Helping others realize their college dreams is widely satisfying and for those who come here the British educational system opens doors to worlds they never dreamed possible. The reason I came to England was because of the scholarship that I got from the Inlex Foundation. And I came uh, initially to study biology at Cambridge. And after I finished my degree, um, things changed and I decided to stay on and pursue a career in music. We focused more on some traditional subjects like law, economics, pure science, um, philosophy, literature. But we then moved into the arts because there was very little funding for the arts. And we don't just focus on Oxford. Um, we've been sending people to Oxford and Cambridge and Imperial and so as, and the London School of Economics. Azad's generosity flows in many directions. Not only does he enable Indian students to come to Britain through his contributions to teaching fellowships and research, he's ensured that Oxford too has the opportunity to learn about India. The centre was founded about 15 years ago and it's for the academic study of Hinduism, Hindu culture. Uh, it's the only centre of its kind in the world that is, has a structured systematic approach to Hindu studies at the academic level. Um, and that's interesting because not even in India do we have such an institution. We have students from literally all over the world, from every continent. Um, 
Uh, we have from Tanzania, from Israel, from Russia, from Australia, from the Americas, from India, obviously. And uh, it's very interdisciplinary. And this kind of intellectual hothouse is going to be very important. Education has various forms. And here, in the beautiful and quaint city of Nottingham, education in traditional Indian music has come down from two generations to the very talented singer, Santu. His grandfather started his musical journey as a Gurbani singer in the local Gurdwara. From grandfather to father and father to son, the music of the Gurbani morphed into the rhythm of rock. But the songs Santu sings still include the ones his father wrote for him. Growing up with, with a father that sings in a quite you know popular band um, in the UK, it was absolutely amazing. He's very switched on. I must say that you know he's, he's blessed in such a way that um, that there's not a lot, but he's just a great follower. He's a great listener, you know, and then he just absolutely interprets it exactly the way he wants it to be. <laughs> Armed and ready for the world, Santu now climbs the rungs of success through hard work and a bit of flair. Sunrise Radio 1458. Music flows through radio waves and enriches and entertains many in their daily lives. Sunrise was actually the world's first independent commercial radio station. It was very important, not just from the cultural and the musical side, but this public policy input was very, very important. Far-sighted media entrepreneur Dr. Aftar Litt didn't become a voice for just his community, but a beacon for Britain's many minorities. There's not the only Sunrise Radio. The facilities were for the Afro-Caribbeans, for the Turkish community, Greek community, so they got their own radio stations. As Sunrise Radio caters to diaspora audience, a band from the vibrant and culturally diverse city of Birmingham called Swami is breaking out to a larger audience. We are on Soho Road in Birmingham, which is the closest you can get to inside of England to being back in India. That's why this is the, the street where most of the early immigrants from India first came. My family owned the Kodak shop that we can see across the road. And it was my dad who originally took the photos that we would become the album covers for Mokit Singh and various other artists who made it quite big at those times. Swami's original music was actually sold on these very streets. Following in the footsteps of bands like UB40 that fuse musical traditions from Birmingham's different ethnic groups, Swami explores issues of identity through their music. We're bringing these ideas of fusion together in a new way, in a pop way, in a, in a way in which it truly represents us growing up as Indian people, but being very much British at the same time. One, two. That is 
ਜਿੰਨਾ ਜੀਵੇ ਸੋਣ ਵਿੱਚ ਚੜਾ ਤੇਰਾ ਕਿੱਥੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਥੱਲੇ ਅੱਗ ਤੁਲ ਕੋ ਕੇ ਮੁੰਡਿਆਂ ਨੇ ਪਾਉਣਾ ਪੰਗੜਾ ਪਾਉਣੀ ਪੰਗੜਾ ਤੇਰੇ ਨਾਲ ਕੱਲੀ ਹੋ ਕੇ ਮੁੰਡਿਆਂ ਨੇ ਪਾਉਣਾ ਪੰਗੜਾ one of the main things that we always talk about within the band swan is that one line was featured in one of our songs and that's been prominent throughout the years and it's just that one question so who am i so who am i that one phrase encapsulates the band's name swami <laughs> Metal. I'm mixed race, so I'm half Punjabi and half English. I grew up very kind of conflicted in a sense about what my identity was, and doing the music that we do, it allows me to kind of feel complete and that I'm not just focusing on one half of my ethnic heritage or the other. I get to be both. Britain and India are building on bonds of not just culture and art but through the energy of the diaspora they share they're moving beyond the painful past to forge rock solid relationships in business and politics the way that india is having to come up with very very creative ideas around its economic balance that creativity is being applied and other places can learn from it including the uk We're going to see more and more prominent Indians taking on much bigger, much more uh, strategic roles within existing multinational corporations. And I think that Indian companies themselves will start to become household name brands, not just within India but throughout the world. I think Indians are comfortable here, and I think it works both ways. Um, it, it's a very easy relationship, and I think that's why there is such a large Indian population here. there is so much shared history uh, i didn't have to learn anything when i came here i almost knew everything about life here i knew historically where they stand who they are where they come from what they do what is the culture there was a time where we used to use these words like mixed race and half caste where you're half indian and you're half this or you're half why can't you be fully both why can't i be fully english and fully indian when britain is playing i'm with england but if india is playing against any team i will howl and shout for india i'm very proud to be a zoroastrian party i'm very proud to be british i'm very proud to be an asian and indian in britain and i think that having that pride in one's roots and being close to your roots is very important but also to integrate in the community in which you're living in the diaspora's contributions to the united kingdom have been legion building lives in a new land they help bring two cultures together two countries closer and make two people one there is no longer this idea that britishness is necessarily white british mm -hmm. britishness is made up of all sorts of cultures including the asian culture within the english language there are so many words uh, that are indian words that are now incorporated within english uh, that are used every day by by British people juggernaut pakka shampoo 
I could just go on. India's vibrancy has changed the UK and that's all to the good. There's one music I really love, and that's... Did I sing it? Don't pass the high, you must cry. Tumme na jane kya, sabune di kaya. Apuro mira dil, jane ya chota hai. Bya kar hai, kuchu kuchu hota hai.